uh, where Intuosu is. Um, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry. Um, hi, everyone, um, and greetings from Detroit. Uh, very happy to be with you, at least virtually here, and sorry that I'm not able to be there in person. I'm quite gutted. Um, but uh, we're really happy and, and honored to to present some some papers today um, about this on the theme of mobility histories for mobile urban futures and planning African mobility systems. Um, and the goal of this this um, panel was to think about how um, African history can help inform uh, more kind of grassroots driven approaches to urban planning around mobility issues. Um, and so we have three papers today. We're going to go in a slightly different order um, than than what is uh, presented in the um, in the program. Um, and actually, if it's possible, I'm going to ask Samson Faboy to to join us first. Uh, and understand Samson's in the room. Is that correct? Hi, Samson. Um, uh, so Samson is pursuing his PhD in urban and regional planning at the University of Johannesburg, and his research investigates and portends the future relevance of traditional governance systems within the context of South African urbanity. Um, he's going to present for us today on um, a very interesting project, uh, Expanding Urbanization, Possibilities for Nomadic Urbanity in the Future of Afro-Urbanization. Thank you, Samson. All right, thank you very much. Yes, um, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Samson Fabwe. I am a Nigerian, uh, but I'm studying at the University of Johannesburg um, at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, where I'm completing my PhD. So um, this afternoon, I'm gonna talk about um, expanding urbanization possibilities for nomadic urbanity in the future of Afro urbanization. Uh, do join me along. Um, yeah, yeah, these are the key themes from uh, my presentation. Uh, we're looking, looking at uh, concerns about urban, uh, urban futures, typology of the urban, theories from Constance and Lefab on um, urban futures. Then I will ask the question, can nomadism be urban? And then I would um, then look at how we can infuse nomadism in 21st century urbanism uh, and beyond. Then we'll conclude. All right. Um, so we are in the 21st century, but um, from the 20th century, there have been concerns about uh, the rate of urbanization around the world. In 1950, a study was carried out and noted that 30% of uh, the world's populace uh, lived in urban centers. And as uh, so at 2014, it's 54%. And um, by 2050, it's estimated to be uh, 68% by the United Nations. And then 7.7 um, .7 billion people currently are in the world now. And by 2050, we'll have 9.7 billion. And of course, um, how does it affect Africa? Africa's population is roughly 1.3 billion. And um, the future of um, urbanization is estimated to be in Africa. And Sub-Saharan Africa's population is expected to double uh, by a billion by 2050. So we'll probably be having over 2 billion Africans and um, the bulk of them will be gravitating towards cities. Um, so there have been um, significant changes in um, the way we live in cities, um, courtesy of um, two unfortunate wars that happened in the 20th century. Um, of course, uh, there have been several wars, but the World War I and the World War II uh, did um, raise um, significant epochs in the way we live in cities. And um, in Europe, uh, sorry, we have to talk about Europe, even though we're trying to generate um, stories from theories from the South. Um, we had the modern movement in architecture. Uh, we had the Bauhaus. Uh, we had construction technology. And how did that affect? Um, for the first time, we now began to see that um, uh, inventions into mass housing, yes, and brutalist architecture, the likes. And then we also had um, information technology and the internet age from um, the 1950s or the 1960s. And of course, um, we, had, uh, we, had, we had the nuclear age. 
Um, so uh, what is a ban? What, what do we, what we call what is a ban? A ban um, really pr probably means um, maybe a city. Um, there are places of um, diverse economic activities. So it's associated with uh, both primary, secondary and tertiary production. And historically, we've had um, urban centers in Africa. Although it's debated by some scholars that um, Africa's urbanity, historic urbanity is negligible and should not be talked about. And there's so much to talk about um, European urbanism. But then according to Blair and um, Child and uh, uh, Kokrovich, uh, they've been able to identify that um, there are distinct um, characteristic of historic urbanity in Africa. And of course, we talk about Egypt. Egypt is um, the glory of Africa every time uh, we talk about Memphis, uh, the first capital of Egypt, about 5,000 5, BC. Uh, yes, I have my Egyptian friends there. I don't, I'm sure I'm correct. Okay. Then uh, we, it's, it's an example of monumental urbanism because when you move around Africa, there is this story that, okay, what can we, what can we see? What are the relics of urban centers from the past? Unlike when you go in Europe, you see the Colosseum and you see different um, relics of urban, urban systems. But in Africa, our studies have shown that, yes, we have monumental urbanism. We can talk about that of Egypt. And we can look at that down south in um, Zimbabwe, close to Russia. We have the Mapungubwe ruins, uh, which uh, are examples of monumental urbanism. Then we then have uh, what we call um, satellite urbanism. And that's was typical of uh, West Africa. Uh, we had Oyo, um, Benin City. I wouldn't go into trying to... Um, explain it, but those places were historically dense settlements um, before uh, the colonial era. Now, then we now go to the controversial one, nomadism. Um, in Central Africa, we had what we call migratory cities. Uh, when you, if you go there around the Congo, uh, Rwanda, you probably may not be able to keep, uh, uh, look at and say, okay, these are historic cities from a thousand years or 2000 years ago, but studies have shown that um, there was a pattern of migration. So they leave the migratory cities. So the cities or the settlement start pattern of the Bakungu, uh, the Congo people uh, in Angola and DRC, they move, they settle in a spot like this and you, you this type of uh, ephem using ephemeral materials like a raffia touch. And when they settle in a spot and after some time they move, but essentially the characteristic of urban centers is that uh, it's not just the characteristics that, okay, you have brick and mortar lasting a thousand or 5,000 years, but it's in the characteristics of the function it carries out. And that's it. It carries out administrative function, religious function, multi-functions, and not just um, only uh, just living functions. Yeah, so we go back to the North Africa. Uh, we had this, um, Ibn um, Haludun, I think he's from Algeria. He critiqued um, nomadism uh, in his um, book, uh, Al Mukadima. He says that the very nature of nomadic existence is a negation of buildings, which is the basis of civilization. So he's saying that um, nomads, because um, of course, nobody could be as nomadic as the Arabs uh, living in the Bedouin tents, moving from place to place. And he says, those guys are uh, a negation of nomadism, uh, of, uh, of civilization. And when we look at what we call civilization, you see that um, in the Paleolithic era, man was moving from place to place. Uh, and then when we got into the Neolithic era, uh, then man began to settle and maybe cities began to grow from there. So now, um, after this preamble, we're looking at postmodernism. Uh, we're trying to re reinvent um, nomadism in urbanity. Don't forget that I talked about uh, the migratory cities of um, Central Africa. Um, in, during the Second World War, we had um, this uh, Dutch painter, Constant Anton Nieuwenhuis. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well. He was born in 1920, and he died in 2005. Uh, he's an, he was an artist um, who lived in, born in, in uh, Netherlands, but he lived in Germany and uh, he married a German and uh, he was affected by the effects of the Second World War. And when the bombings fell in um, Dresden, in uh, Belgium, Berlin, and uh, in um, Frankfurt, and um, the cities were, were leveled, then he began to look at how would the cities be revived again? How would these places 
become revived. So he began to look at a futuristic city um, of what the future of what will be urban. And he called, then he began to conceptualize what he called the new Babylonian theory um, from the 1940s to 1950s. And he then published it in 1964 when he addressed a group of um, urban experts and artists. So um, one of the core quotes from his new Babylonian theory is that new Babylon ends nowhere since the earth is round. It knows no frontiers since there are no more national economics or collectivities, since humanity is fluctuating. Every place is accessible to one and all. The whole earth becomes home to its owners. Life is an endless journey across a world that is changing so rapidly that seems forever order. Uh, that was from um, Constant New, uh, New Babylon. Well, he coined uh, the New Babylon from the ancient Babylonian empire uh, of the Middle East. Uh, we talk about Egyptian civilization. We also refer to Mesopotamia as also the cradle of civilization. And from there, we had um, the Humarabi codes, which has influenced our Lego jurisprudence and other inventions in irrigation. So um, he began, and um, Babylon, ancient Babylonia was, um, was an exemplary metropolis, which he looked at trying to reinvent where humanity was free with uh, laws and the likes. Now, um, in uh, the new Babylon theory, uh, he's saying that um, humanity is free to move from place to place. So we could have a building and a building, you could move your building from, a building is not necessarily, a city should not necessarily be rooted to a spot. So if we are in Johannesburg, we should be able to move, I should be able to move my Southwest engineering building somewhere else. You know, that's his concept. Uh, so he says, we, we are free in time and space to move around. So he was, his concept of the future city is not that city that is rooted to a spot and will be permanent. So then, okay, he's saying we can move around the earth. Let's look at how much of the earth we have to explore. Uh, studies have shown that 50% of the earth's land surface has re is remaining untouched by any form of human activity. Okay, so we have the Sahara Desert, we have the Tundra. But according to Rutley, um, around 14.6%, 14, 14 um, amounting to 18.5 million square kilometers of land has already been modified by humans permanently. And this, well, now this 50% of the land surface that has remained untouched are areas necessary for ecosystem, carbon storage, flood control, pollination, and custody of environmental biodiversity. Now, in terms of trying to expand, um, Williams et al. says that, that uh, between 2000 and 2013, an area of 1.9 square kilometers of virgin land has been um, tampered with and uh, permanently influenced by human activity. And that's the size of Mexico. Now they said, um, another study says that, um, uh, okay, uh, Rigo et al. says that um, we can actually expand uh, that he, they, they are of the opinion that we can move and um, explore new lands, but then um, biodiversity conservation targets of human settlement patterns uh, influence on the environment should be set. So maybe probably as our world leaders are discussing uh, in Sharma Sheikh uh, for COP27 and other future COPs, they should set targets and um, national governments should also set targets on how much we should explore and um, if we and set a biodiversity uh, exploration targets. So this is just a map of how much of the earth is uh, explored. The green areas are places that are wilderness are, or totally no human activity. Uh, the, is it uh, the deep orange or something which is um, places of intense human activity or permanently damaged. And uh, we have the light green that are areas of intact uh, human activity. So now, we want to rationalize the future of urbanity. We've talked about um, the wild ideas of um, constant, uh, but then what are the core things we want to see if we want to begin to adopt this nomadism in urbanity for the future of urbanity? According to the 18th Charter of 1933, it says that um, the core features of urban life when we are going to plan the city is work, living, transport, and recreation. So, those are key themes we have to, at every urban planner or architect or urban practitioner, 
have to infuse into a city that makes that will make a city work and um, livable. So now back to Constance. This is um, the first picture to it. Um, what Constant drew about the future city. So that city is levitating. According to him, the city is levitating so that there is space to move underneath. Then it's infused in blocks like that. It was an abstract painting like that. Then to, right uh, to, to next to it, we have the Jujan High Museum. Um, when um, Constant was speaking, um, in uh, presenting his new Babylonian theory, he was actually speaking to a collection of designers, architects, which we are called the avant-garde. That's the people who think beyond the ordinary uh, to create weird shape and they are ready to explore the limits of um, knowledge or rationality. For example, this kind of building is built after the classical order uh, from Roman inventions of uh, 3,000, 2,000 years ago. And we'll still be following this classical order, but. The avant-garde will not follow this classical order. You see, we have the Jujan High Museum in Bilbao, Spain. It's a typical example of, um, by Frank Gehry, it's a typical example of um, avant-gardeism or it's the constructivism architecture. So it's architecture that does not follow a rigid form and shape. And that is kind of architecture that um, uh, Constant was um, speaking about. Now, okay, let's go back to some theoretical concepts about um, this um, new nomadism. But let's not forget that um, nomadism still exists, but then they are malign now. We have the pastoralists who still move from place to place, uh, the Bedouins who still move from place to place. They still exist. But then according to Ibn uh, Haludun, these guys uh, uh, are, neg are negation to civilization. But then um, Lefort also supported in his urban revolution, also supported the idea but then he noted that we will have to break the capitalist framework because the city as it is, it's, it's a microcosm of capitalism and the, the chaos that it attracts. So he's saying that um, Lefebvre wrote the right to the city uh, uh, urban revolution. And he says that when everybody has a just and equal right to the city, then we are able to break all this um, paraphernalia of structures um, and liberate yeah, so he's saying that basically that um, we should not only liberate just the space, but we should only also liberate the economy of, of the city dwellers. Uh, so he says, starting from this freedom in time and space, we would arrive in, at a new kind of urbanization of mobility, the incessant fluctuation of the population. The logical consequence of this new freedom creates a different relation between a town and a settlement. Okay, now away from the theories, what are the, can nomadism be possible in the 21st century? Uh, we've seen inventions in 3D printing. This building can be printed from architectural models, maybe on Revit or AutoCAD, we could print it out. Yeah, so we don't need to go through the rigors of brick and mortar mixing over six months. And um, we could have prefabricated construction. You could then assemble a building somewhere in a yard and ship it and mount them and lock, lock it and it stands. Then we're also talking, this is the age where we talk about sustainable design, the secular economy and utilitarian architecture. That means whatever we are using to build a building must be sustainable. And if the building at least is circle, it can be reused. These materials can be reused for some other things. Yes, um, sometimes in 1968, a group called Akigram uh, developed a car. So this is the plan of the car actually, and this interior, sorry, I didn't have the exterior of the car, but this is actually a car. It can actually move from place to place. You see, um, it acts as a floor plan of the interior. So, and this particular thing, it uses um, the biogas. So as it moves from place to place, um, the, when the people um, poo or whatever, the waste they pass, uh, they can also be used to power this uh, stuff, you see. so that is actually sustainable and it's moving from place to place. Is it, yes, it's nomadic. And can we use it for other things uh, to expand the city? Can maybe it's a food for thought. Now, okay, then we also look at um, container architecture. Um, in, currently in, in a few weeks time will be all eyes will be in Qatar. We have the stadium 674 is made up of containers and um, after the World Cup, I'm sure it's going to be dismantled and the stadium disappears. But then 
that is a space that has, is going to play host to over 60,000 people. It's a city and it's, it's, it's a city. That city is going to be, it's, going to, it's, it's, it's a kind of city actually. So it's going to be dismantled. We have a shipping yard or um, construction yard where you have mount containers and after some time it goes. So that is in a sense is what we call instantaneous urbanism. So, um, so you could have a space and um, we have temporary temp temporality and after some time, when it outlives its usefulness, it goes. So the idea of a city just being permanent in brick and mortar, I think um, is something that may not be, uh, may be challenged uh, going forward. So what are the key takeaways uh, from nomadic urbanity? Uh, noting that um, African cities are developing. So we have the luxury to actually explore our master plans and tweak it and make it flexible to uh, be much more adaptable uh, to the future since the future of uh, the world uh, urbanization is in Africa. So the concept of working and living in the 21st century and beyond is mobile. Um, COVID-19 has shown us the peculiarities. So we necessarily do not need to be all start, uh, staying in one place to do one activity. Somebody can stay somewhere, stay somewhere, and we can all connect to an activity. No thanks to technology. And that's one of the key takeaways from um, uh, technology takeaways from the 20th century. Cities are living beings. As much as it exudes permanence, it's actually temporal. Um, in Egypt, we talk and in Syria, we talk about what we call a necropolis. And that is where a city of the dead. So you've actually had cities that were places that were vibrant, like Babylon, it was vibrant some 3,000 years ago, but today it's no more. So Johannesburg can be very vibrant today. We have a great Zimbabwe, which was vibrant, and today it's normal. So we'll be having places like that, vibrant, maybe Johannesburg, and today, tomorrow again, another thing we take over, and Johannesburg will be less significant, and probably it will begin to die. So in as much as cities in, a, in its original concept are actually living beings, they die. So why don't we begin to plan for temporariness rather than permanence, okay? Then, um, we are having the cost of this multiple infrastructure that can be deployed to regenerate city precincts in temporality or dynamic permanence as it didn't fit. So mobile cars, containers, um, we can use it to generate regenerate city precincts. Of course, we have um, in cities, uh, in as much as they, they tend to be permanent, we have some areas of cities that tend to die. And then we begin, begin to do what we call urban renewal or urban regeneration. So we could begin to plan for, uh, so in, in interim, when the government is maybe hesitating, what can we do? We could plan it for, we could plan a temporariness for maybe 20 years, 10 years, you see, and then that place is converted to another use. So planning for temporariness is um, very important. So. Um, so that brings me to the last point that temporary spaces within cities are important as permanent ones. So um, I'm, I'm my key takeaway is that um, in as much as cities uh, tend to be in brick and mortar or uh, uh, exudes permanence, they are actually temporary spaces and cities, uh, city planners or uh, city practitioners should plan for temporariness inculcating all the spheres of uh, technology um, that uh, the wonders technology has given us because uh, the future of cities is temporary and we, can, we are all nomads. Thank you very much. I didn't unmute myself. Thank you so much, Samson, for uh, that really interesting talk and, and pushing us to think in different ways about mobility and, and what it means for urban futures. Um, we're having some slight technical difficulties, I think, um, right now. So we apologize for that. And uh, we're trying to work those out. But um, I'm hoping, in Jogo, can we have Matthias come next? Um, I hope that's okay. Um, uh, so I'll go ahead and introduce him. Um, 
Matthias Chikuri Siani is a PhD student and the Benjamin Franklin Fellowship awardee at the Department of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Chukuri uh, earned his baccalaureate degree in history and international studies from the University of Nigeria in Suka and a master's degree um, in economic history at, at Nande Ezekwe University. Uh, he's from Enugu, Nigeria, and um, he worked as a lecturer in the Department of History and International Studies at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Nigeria in Suka, and has published a number of articles and book chapters in both local and international journals. Uh, Matthias is uh, is with us today, but also has a, a recording, an audio recording that we're going to play alongside his slides. Um, and uh, this uh, this paper that we're going to hear is called Cities After War, the Post-Civil War Reconstruction in Nigeria and the Sociality of Transportation in Onisha Urban City. Um, and uh, Matthias will be able to uh, answer questions um, as he is with us um, later, so so he he will be able to do that. So um, thank you very much to the technicians for helping us make this happen. Good morning. Uh, Matthias, I think wait until the recording is over. Okay.
the, 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 the reintegration of our nature was without personal vendetta by the Nigerian government on how to save the, the people, the Igbo people living in that particular area. And one of the things that this person that was appointed taking orders from the federal government did was to remap the city communication lines. In a focus group discussion I had for this study, avails that the roads in our nature was not like this during the Nigerian Biafra war, but was disconnected after the war. The consciousness of this is that after the war, the Nigerian government as a, as a, a sort of trying to uh, uh, venom their anger on the Igbo group, try to reconstruct some of the roads that benefited the Igbo people. Some of these roads that we are five meters yard or five lanes, three lanes, we are merged into one. That the city began to experience traffic conditions, experienced flooding, experiencing erosion, and also experiencing ill housing in the city. Another interview we had with Obuka CI mentioned that I was in Onicha during the war. The road connection in Onicha currently is different from what we had earlier before the war. This was as a result of the Nigerian groups trying to save the Igbo group out of Nigerian economic wealth. The, the consciousness of the Nigerian group was to disadvantage this group of people from benefiting from the war. That if they wanted to, to, to uh, 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 that since they have segregated themselves from the government, that now they have to suffer it by bringing up a sort of new map that will force in the that we forcing people to live the way they, they don't want to live in, in, in the place. This is a result of this. And secondly, what we, what 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 also happened as a result of this educational program was the increase in slums and ghettos in our nature as a result of this communication lines. The areas that we are mapped out that people should not live became an abode for people, which has turned into slums and ghettos in different parts of our nature, and has affected the drainage system, and has also increased the, 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 the worldview, the perspective of, of what a city, or what the city was before the war, that people move into ghettos, people move into slums, as a result of these areas that we are not usually meant for people to live, but because the reconstruction program could not provide areas meant for people to, to live and, and uh, habitate, now left them to desert to areas where they, they also build, build whatever they want. Thus, causing slums. And these slums today has led to increase in erosion and mass, and mass, and mass uh, displacement. Thirdly, as we are going to look at, it's urban crimes. That as a result of this remapping of road networks, it has increased the high rate of urban crimes in our nature. And, the, and one of the focus groups we also had here also mentioned, as a result of this road remapping in our nature has increased Theft, crime, rape in our nature. Because of trying to remap 
the route the provision connections of furniture many places be, uh, became a high a, a hideout for hoodlums for uh, for assassins and all that trying to um uh, uh, trying to make the city look like a a a, a a, a, a shifted area from other parts of Nigeria that because people cannot go there because people cannot uh, because the the, the the sociality of the of, of the roots are disconnected it became an area or some part became an area where people can 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 kidnap someone can steal from people can also uh, 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 kill people at their leisure. Someone also said here again, on coming out from my house, I see lots of dead bodies from places where roads were before the war. These are sort of um, urban crimes as a result of road disconnection. Road disconnection from what was before in our nature and what is now in our nature. That after the war, Onicha be, began to experience poor sociality of transportation routes in Onicha. Traffic congestion became the order of the day that someone cannot travel from Onicha metropolis down to Ogidi without spending at least an hour on a drive in something about 1.4 miles away because the only route leading to that place is one. Someone coming in from Enugu takes that same route. Someone going from Onitsha to that place takes the same route. Therefore, disconnecting the, the, the city from what an urban city should look like and who defines an urban city, the government defines an urban city for people who are living in Onitsha and has also affected the, the growth of the city till date that people cannot come into Onitsha, which was previously an, an, a, 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 an economic hub of the nation. People cannot, cannot come into the city to transport themselves and also to organize a business transformation group in the city to date because of the challenges of this uh, 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 transportation uh, uh, a disconnection. Yeah. So the, 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 the idea is that transportation routes attract net in migration. And when it's not solved, it affects the economic wealth of a particular group of people. And that's what the Nigerian Biafran War, the Afro of Nigerian Biafran War did to Igbo people. That the Igbo people has been affected in its gross domestic product, has been affected by its net in migration, have been affected by its economic growth, have been affected by its communication lines with, with the with diaspora, people living within uh, on, on axis, and also affected people who want to invest in our nature. Thank you. And the, the strategic com uh, communication lines of these people have affected the residential places and the areas meant for people to live comfortably. By uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in 2020, areas that was not supposed to be housed by any residential, uh, 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 any residential houses witnessed collapse of buildings. About 25 buildings collapsed in our nature as a result of remapping of these areas that we are not meant for people to habitate, for people to live. And the consciousness of the federal government was to allow people to live there and to suffer the effect of facing the civil war. Since last month, October, the city has experienced four death. People have been displaced. Some of the challenges of this is a result of housing, housing uh, 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 structures, illegal structures everywhere. 
places that are, that are supposed to be roads are all filled with building. And as a result of building, there is no, there is no channel route for drainage system in the place. So the, 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 the study is looking at the experiences of people who is living in our nature after the war. And the experiences, are what the war did and what the aftermath of the war is still doing to the transportation with the connection lines of the Igbo people using our nature, their main urban city as a point of discussion. And this research concludes that the federal government of Nigeria impoverished the Igbo people as a result of the reintegration after the war. As a result of reintegrating Igbo people during the war, they remapped the road networks that benefited these people before the war. And the, the study recommends that the federal government should re reinvestigate the road maps, the communication lines of this group, and widen the horizon of reintegrating groups that fought the war. That after the war, uh, and as a one nation, the need to forge ahead and to increase the economic growth of not only the people living on nature, but also to add to the existing economic domestic product of our country, Nigeria. And when this is done, the United Nations 2030 solution on poverty, urban poverty, and, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and the betterment of environment will be gifted by 2030. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And um, we're supposed to have a third presenter, but they don't, uh, Samuel Tosu seems not to have, or seems to have encountered some uh, technical difficulties and isn't joining us at the moment. If that changes, we will, uh, we will uh, have him join up. Um, I just wanted to take a, a minute as, as a panel convener, the kind of privilege of being a panel convener to um, to speak a little bit about um, the connections between these um, these papers that are on the surface very different, um, and and to talk a little bit about why it's so important, All right? So um, you know the the goal of this um, of this panel is really to think about how we can take the skills and knowledge and perspectives of um, of history and anthropology and other sorts of qualitative research and and apply it to think about um, contemporary issues in the world of practice. Um, too often, uh, conversations about development have been separated from, and urban planning and architecture and other sorts of issues have been separated from, um, from this kind of research. And um, those scholars have not always been in conversation in the ways that they should. And as a result, we get the reproduction of of inequalities and, um, and, and the reproduction of, of structural violence and other sorts of issues over and over and over again, um, not just in African cities, but around the world, right? Um, thinking about how, um, thinking about what kind of African histories of, um, of mobility can, can bring us is not just about, um, you know, theories from the global South for their sake, right? Um, but they're, they're about trying to advance an approach that is more just, that is more um, reflective of the needs of local populations to, um, to create more effective systems and to create systems that have meaning. Um, in doing that, I think um, one of the things that I appreciate about both of these papers is, is thinking carefully about, and there's a long tradition of this in, in, in across the continent, um, thinking really carefully about the the kinds of values that undergird the way that we think about living in and moving through space, right? And um, where that comes from and how it's changed over time. And the 
and then and then thinking about how we can take some of those ideas right and and inform our conversations in the present about what the future should look like so um i really appreciate these two papers and um i think we we have lots of time because of our uh, lack of a third presenter um for questions and um i i i can see the people online but i can't necessarily see the people in the room so if uh, if someone in the room wants to field questions, I, I welcome that and appreciate it. I see Ola Shogun is has his hand up. So we'll go we'll start there first. And then whoever in the room wants to field the questions, please feel free. Thank you very much. Are you hearing me? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for the presenters. Uh, these are fascinating papers, um, uh, especially the, on on the urban spaces and um, narratives. I, as uh, you know, I, I'm, 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 an, I'm, I'm an ecomusicologist or we call climatic musicology, looking at how music engages indigenous knowledge, you know, um, in, in in urban narratives and you know, sounding the urban with me, see, or, you know, kind of visualizing too. And the issue of Onisha, I have comments and questions, is that one, currently we have what's called sit down, sit down kind of occupy, is not, is almost like occupy the Southeast in kind of sitting down as a form of protest, all right? It's not, it's occupying their homes, the immobility on almost every Monday, you know, triggered by the fights you know, for for liberation liberation of southeast south 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 southeast people, and um, uh, and you know, and which because you mentioned issue of economic wealth, uh, and I see how does this sit sit down help the economic growth? Because from the through this sitting down, many industries they've left you know southeast to south south and other regions of the country. So which is Further destroys the economic of Onisha and other uh, southeast region. Secondly, the issue of flooding, and because I've written a paper on indigenous knowledge and flooding, sounding the floods in Nigeria, you know, and and I and I discovered that is, the city spaces like Lagos, you know, they, they have the tendency because of the daily activities and you know uh, the, the multitude of people coming in every day. So apart from the federal government engagement. Can you can can city space itself or the the, the individual the, the 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 people there is there anything they can do apart from waiting for federal government because yeah federal government has a part but what can we do as a local people to help in our own area at least all right yeah like you said illegal building is there any way we can stop this or correct this from the local point of view all right now i'm talking finally in the, in the area of welfare and you know kind of social and you know expression of people living uh, and, and erosion i know that is is full of godly erosion and the land is very you know kind of land issues like we're talking about the sons and daughters of the soil the, the soil issue that you know this bringing these floods and so is there anything you know because this day i think you have to be thinking about what can we do eco resilience from eco side what can we do for 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 urban space or Nisha specifically to salvage? You know, not really waiting for federal government alone. So that this, these are my questions. And how can we cope these ecological issues, climate change? You know, in terms of you know the the, the city space in in uh, in, in the southeast or Nisha as a case study. Thank you. I think if there's uh, if there's other questions and or comments in the room, we can take more. I think the answer. I just let's. I think there's another question or comment. Yeah. So Sorry, I just want to tell you, Jennifer, there are no questions or comments right now in the room. Okay, great. Then, uh, Matthias, uh, feel free to go on. Okay. Thank you, uh, for the 
questions and for the questions you you raised and um first of all i i want to address the issue of uh, sit at home in on that you raised is um is a very uh, detrusting event for a year now and lingering to two years there's no doubt that the sit at home has affected the city economically any it has affected it drastically and it's still affecting it and the consciousness of this is that you know people who don't even know uh, uh, about the war has also taken it up on themselves and uh, causing sort of mayhem in the city and disrupting the affairs of the city that even the governor you know the 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 incumbent governor when when he when he came he wanted to you know stop it and all that but it was over it, it overwhelmed him and all that so sit at home also adds in fact it it's currently adds to the you know the economic meltdown not only in anambra state on nature but the entire southeastern nigeria that even um uh, uh, People, industries are not even welcomed in the state again because of high uh, high, high risk of being uh, being involved in all this uh, 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 catastrophe in the society. So, the uh, as a sort of this uh, that it has really uh, detrusted the the economy more. Now, secondly, we mentioned about fraud. Then, that apart from the government, what can we do? I mentioned about slums and ghettos that the, the individuals can actually do something. And how, how can they do something? They will do something by, you know, grabbing out all these refuse dumps. You know, I just picture the refuse dump. That place is a major site in our nature, at Obodubu Road in our nature. People are people are living there. As you can see, people are, people are also standing there. These are people's. These are these are inhabitants living in that place. And what do they do? They don't even have a trash bin. They don't even have anything on their way out. They will just put it anyhow they, they like. And currently, that place about three thousand two eighty two person is being displaced currently in that particular street in, in our nature because the 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 water has no place to go. The drainage is already, already dumped. So there is no, the, the individuals should also be um, uh, uh, researchized on their concepts because the government cannot also, uh, cannot do everything. But the individuals, the, the, uh, the, the urban planners, the government has been sensitizing the individuals. But the consciousness is that despite the federal government is not doing much, what are we as individuals doing to propagate all these, all these, uh, all these? Now talking about you mentioned about the illegal, illegal building. This is another issue in our nature. Open clusters and an illegal building because there are places in our nature that colonial map, colonial map uh, recorded in, in archives that are not supposed to have any structures. In our nature, but because of this challenge of remapping after the Nigerian Biafran War, people erected houses there in our nature today, and those places hinder uh, uh, water from 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 passing general. And when you want to destroy that that building, people people revolt against it. What happening now in Anambra State? The governor is about is currently demolition illegal structures. But what, what are people doing? People are fighting the government. People are revolting. People are even stoning those who came, who, who came all the way along to destroy these illegal buildings. So our challenge in that city is that the, the original map of that city was affected during the Nigerian Biafran War. And the effect, if not corrected, will, will, will do greater harm to the city in the next future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if there's no other questions in the room, I actually had a question for Samson. Um, and Samson, I wonder if if you could talk a bit about, um, you know, are there examples of um, nomadic urbanism in the present in the city that, that you could point to that could serve as 
as models or ways um, that, or provocations for government to think differently um, that are already there that could that could help us um, push back against some of these uh, some of these practices and reframe uh, the way that we think about planning. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. I well, um, in when we talk about nomadic urbanism, uh, the, it's something I'm still reading much about. Uh, and again, it's uh, something that is novel. Um, yes, it's something that is novel. So um, there is there is one aspect that is called um, instant urbanism, and that's um, uh, creating life or creating activity in a dead zone for just a short period of time. And after maybe a few, after the duration of the activity there, the place goes dead again. Uh, for example, if we, if we cast our minds to, the thing is already with us, it's just um, how we could then deploy it to um, uh, other things. For example, when we have uh, musical shows, I just talked about the, the World Cup uh, at Qatar, which may not uh, maybe be too much of a big example, where we uh, the designers are already looking at, okay, we're building uh, stadiums. For example, Qatar um, is a country, I think they're less than 5 million, maybe 2 million or thereabout. Uh, so the infrastructure required to execute the World Cup is not something that it's um, sustainable to be maintained um, over the course of um, forever. So they came with the engineer, the designers came with the ingenuity and say, okay, we're building this stadium and after this World Cup, we're going to dismantle it. And that was for one. Then the, a couple of other stadiums, they are actually going to be deconstructed. So maybe a stadium that was, one of the stadiums that was capacity for maybe uh, 60,000 or 50,000 people, would they will reduce the capacity and it's gonna be for like uh, maybe 5,000, it seats 5,000 people. So we could actually have spaces. And after that, after the, um, the event, then we could deconstruct it. Taking note that um, these materials we use, we tend to we have to be using sustainable materials that can be deployed to use somewhere else. So for example, the ingenuity that was used uh, in terms of container architecture. So after the event, the containers are deployed to some other uses. Then we have what we call instant urbanism. It's already with us. Um, we, we can cast our minds to musical shows that happens in open spaces. When there are these kind of musical shows, you have a, you, you, it, it, it's uh, typified by having a very big lorry come in. Then the lorry, all the musical gadgets, the, the, the trunk of the lorry becomes the musical performance stage. Then you have people coming around. So sometimes these musical shows could go for one week and two. So people could then camp in tents around. There are a lot of economic activities going on there. Then maybe after the week show is off, or maybe a day or two or one week, depending on how long it is, or a camp, then it's off. So the idea is that, okay, uh, we're deploying technology. Yeah, we could actually uh, create life in anywhere, any part of, any part of, any, any, any space or any, any area. And then the materials you're gonna use are, uh, are something that would fit into the circular economy. Yes, uh, I think, um, I, I don't know if I have spoken to your thoughts or if you haven't. You have, that's great. Um, I know there's there's some questions from the floor. Then as we transition to that, I'll just say that uh, what immediately occurred to me was the idea that um, our, uh, what the transport systems and paratransit systems in many parts of the continent that often get labeled as informal or various things that often get labeled as informal might better be qualified or might better be understood through this nomadic urbanism concept. So that's, I appreciate that. Uh, I see Ruth has a microphone. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, helping us to uh, think out of the box uh, uh, in kind of futuristic uh, terms. It's always uh, for historians, uh, a little bit in a, a discomfort zone, I would say. Um, uh, but I appreciate the uh, uh, the way you evoke the new Babylon and Neiman House and um, uh, the, the way the city is not a fixed place, but it's like a pop-up or can be reconfigure depending on its functionality. Um, the, the question I, I have is, um, uh, something that mobility studies has has 
contemplated about um, during COVID. I think one of the uh, the pandemic, the insights really was that up to a point, the ability to move around seemed to be a positive thing, right? It seemed to be something that, um, uh, yeah, the happy few maybe could could do uh, transcend national boundaries and so forth. And then the pandemic showed kind of an, another side that. Um, it, people uh, who were not necessarily bound up to the materiality of, of mobilities could stay at home and get all kinds of goods delivered. So the, the economy of, of um, uh, people who did not have the luxury to stay home, but actually had to be mobile in order to uh, make a living and to make uh, the pandemic uh, lockdowns possible. So I, I wonder if you could, could from that perspective, um, reflect on the, the kind of class dimension of the, the, the pop-up uh, uh, urbanity or the, the mobile mobility that you, that you were uh, advocating, uh, how goods get delivered, um, uh, who, who can move and who cannot move. Uh, is the nomadic urbanity, is that something to strive for or not? Yeah, thanks, uh, Stimmy Jennifer. Uh, yeah, thanks to both papers. Very interesting. Two quick questions. Um, the one writing on Ruth's question in relation to the futuristic uh, paper on rethinking the urban in Africa, I found it really interesting, um, especially your initial discussion on how urbanism has featured uh, on the African continent. Um, and my question is, uh, I guess, writing on that comment, how would you, how do you think your sort of imaginations of nomadic urbanism uh, then collides with, uh, intersects with contemporary thinking of uh, urban planning in the African context, um, where there's a very strong thrust to, on the one hand, um, in satisfying like the material conditions of people's needs for water, sanitation, electricity, and so on. This kind of practical realities from like a city government perspective uh, are very much aligned with the fixed. Um, so that's my question to you. And then the next one, uh, the quick question to the uh, Matthias on your paper on uh, the post-war in Onisha. Just a quick one. Uh, I was wondering how your study uh, links in with um, what are sort of the debates that your paper is playing with uh, in the literature, um, because I, I see that your work has a very interesting and strong sort of normative um, interest, as we all do. Um, but I'm curious how you're thinking. Uh, yeah, what are the debates that your work is building upon uh, on these things? Uh, mine is more of a comment to Samson. I think listening to your work, I couldn't help but think about, um, I read about a pop-up city in India that happens every 12 years. It is a festival that holds about 30 people. I think of a eight days festival. Um, and the way the um, Indian city authorities have structured the city is that it's able to accommodate those 30 people within those, you know, six day festival. And then after that, all the infrastructure um, disappears and then they do it again next 12 years. So that, that I think that would be such an interesting case study for you. Happy to share that. All right, thank you, um, Samson. That's a very wonderful presentation. Actually, uh, while we are very much busy concerned about uh, future of mobility, uh, you are concerned about future of uh, uh, housing or settlement. I think that's an interesting 
uh, futuristic approach to, to settlement. Uh, I don't know, um, I remember watching a documentary where I saw a whole city built uh, and that city is termed as eco-friendly city. You know, most of the stuffs that were used in building such cities, uh, stuffs that are naturally obtained, you know, from the environment. And even the electricity supply uh, in, uh, made of solar, you know, sunlight generation and so on. So I think um, it will be important if you can incorporate such ideas into this, you know, uh, uh, approach of futuristic, you know, nomadic settlement. Uh, uh, I think it will give it a very good um, uh, perspectives. Then to Matthias, well, um, I don't know, uh, I'm a bit concerned uh, for you to attribute some of the problems associated with urbanism in contemporary Onisha city uh, after or as a result of the civil war. My concern is this civil war took place between 19, uh, 1969 to, I mean, 66 to somewhere around 1970, 71. You're talking about 50 years later. You have different governments different administrators who are in charge of the city. And I wonder, these administrators, despite the reconstruction, rehabilitation and reintegration that took place a few years later. Now, I don't know, uh, do you mean to say that this administration have not put uh, any mechanism in place to address some of these problems up till this moment? That is one. Secondly, I think some of the issues that you have raised associated with the, uh, I mean, the, the post-war reconstruction problems are common issues that are found in different parts of the country. I am also from Nigeria. The flooding issues, for instance, in the far north, the northern Nigeria, we have experienced, particularly this year, flooding in many places. Talk of Jigawa states, you are very much familiar with the Jigawa state. Many people, about 300 died. Many were rendered about 3,000 homeless. You know, in Kano, we have similar experiences. And if you go to Lokoja, right now, as I'm talking in Nigeria, uh, we are finding it very difficult to have supply of petroleum uh, motor spirit because the roads around Lokoja has been cut off by the, by the flooding. And, and I don't know, for you to begin to say that you are attributing some of these problems to the reconstruction, does this mean, look at the case of Lagos, for instance, Olushegun was talking about Lagos, one of the major cities with some of these, you know, these problems are very common in Lagos and, and, and so on. Even the urban crime you are talking about, insecurity and so on, is a common phenomenon almost in every part of the, I mean, of the country. So I, I, I really, really, it, it got me worried that um, after 50 years, uh, you are still attributing some of these problems. And uh, Olushegun raised a fundamental question you know, because of the agitation, uh, probably some people may want to know what this sit at home, you know, that Olushegun was talking about. You, you see, this is a form of um, a resistance. You know, after these years, the Igbo people who are in the southeastern part of the country, some of them still develop this idea of agitating for a, a nationhood, even after the Biafran war that was fought about 50 years uh, back. Now, as a result of that, uh, some organizations came up with this idea that every Monday of the week, people should not go out. People should sit at home. And this has seriously affected the economy, you know, of, of, of this state. In fact, I was reading 
on, on, on a paper just last week, uh, about 13 people were boarded a bus on Monday in violation of the sit at home order. And the whole bus with the people inside were set ablaze and were born to ashes. So I, I, I think um, uh, there are other issues that are more related to these problems that you are talking about rather than the reconstruction and the rehabilitation that took place about 50 years ago. Thank you. I, I just want to make uh, uh, a couple of comments. The, the papers, I think both of them are ex ex extremely exciting. And I enjoyed the, the spirited attempt to push the boundaries. For instance, uh, the Samson's paper, the notion of nomadism, as we understand it, at first I was a little, uh, I, I know I've worked with nomads, the actual ones, but you sort of pushed me to another level so that I'm, I'm beginning to think maybe there is a conversation there. And, uh, but first let me talk about, uh, I think uh, that is Matthias. Ma, 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 the, uh, just following up on the, on, I think Yusuf, Yusuf's comments, you, 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 I think the paper is very exciting, the topic is very exciting, but you take a, a fairly very straight path from the problem to the solution. Uh, what, uh, for lack of a better word, it's extremely clean for a murky problem. Why I say this, uh, if you look at other cities that were colonially mapped, but were never disrupted by war, they're experiencing the same problems. For example, uh, cities like Nairobi and others, they have the same flooding, some of them, the drainage problems, crime problems. So there's a certain level of consistency which may question the theory of war explaining the current status of Oni, Onis, Onisa city, right? So maybe probably, as bingo, because I, I suspect it's, uh, I, I think it's a work in progress, if you could find a city that shares a similar trajectory except war, and then do a comparison, that may actually go a wrong way to building the, 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 the theoretical, pro, the, the theory, the, 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 the assumption, the argument you're making. But I think it's a little too clean. The other thing is that it absolves the, the residents of complete agency. Like war takes everything, war takes responsibility. At the same time, it also absolves colonialism of almost everything again because it assumes that if what not happened, the colonial plan, as you said in your words, that the colonial plan was disrupted. And I'm not very sure that colonial plan was extremely perfect, but I think there is a discussion there, which you may look at, especially when you look at how urban spaces are resilient and how the people reconstruct after conflict. So that will be an interesting way to look at it and see how, uh, again, after 50 years, how the various mechanisms and uh, practices, strategies, communities, and even governments took up to be resilient, to rebuild, and, uh, and then uh, maybe a critique can be done there. Uh, coming back to nomadism, uh, Samson, uh, again, as I said, it's a very uh, exciting paper. Uh, for those of us with gray hairs, it pushes us to other areas. So, but I think it will be interesting to look at how given that we're also trying to look for southern ways of looking, looking at the uh, global south ways of looking at uh, new, 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 uh, new, new Babylonian, you know, like a, a, Babylon, a Babylon from the south. For example, if you go to the Karamoja of northern Uganda, what their conception of nomadism is not movement for movement sake. It's time structured and they know they have this idea of home. For example, African communities are very sensitive to where they bury. So they may go for years, but they know where they bury their grandmother. They know where they bury their grandfather, or at least they know where their kids were conceived or something like that. So there are certain rituals that accompany this kind of nomadism. So it will be interesting how you marry the two. I, I know the uh, urban uh, uh, 
uh, the, the, there's a sense in which the current urban and the current generation look at look at the idea of trans, transient. You know, you're uh, being where my home is, where my last dirty shirt is. You know that kind of approach. So that can really interpret it and work with this. But the idea of home, the notion of place making and rootedness, how does this? How does it fit into this notion of? Uh, um, uh, nomadic urban urbanism because at the end of the day urbanism is also about home isn't it i i think we have quite a lot of questions at this point that have accumulated so maybe we give the the speakers a chance to respond all right um thank you everybody for uh the diverse comments um I, yeah, and their contributions uh, they were quite insightful I would want to start, um, I probably may not address the questions <clears throat> chronologically, but I'll just try to synthesize the questions to a common answer, because in the end, um, each of the questions are targeted at um, a common goal uh, for the paper. So I will try to do that. Um, so I will start with the last speaker. Really, uh, what actually in, 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 in enthused my in interest in uh, what what actually ignited interest into this nomadic thing was that um, I come from Nigeria also. Um, in Nigeria, we have a problem with nomads. We have a certain um, ethnic group who are Katureras, like uh, your the Maasai in um, East Africa, and um, they are just like moving from place to place. And we say, okay, ranch your cows but they don't want to ranch these cows and they just want to keep moving. And it's causing um, farmers headers, crisis, killings here and there. The cows get into a farm and they clear off. And you no, know, it's, it's, it's just a cyclical violence. So I now began to say, okay, how can these nomads, how can, yes, we, because the problem with a lot of what's in uh, African culture, sometimes we are built, we are steep in conservatism. So we still want to relive the life of 500 years, 600, 1,000 years of practices, the cultural practices. But then in the modern, in, in modernity, a lot of these things, a lot of these cultural practices have to be modified. But then we are having this clash, uh, dualism of Western culture. and our, So what are the cultural practices that we should keep and those that we should not keep? So that's what did, did enthuse it. So I was thinking that, okay, for because the concept was even I was trying to speak to them actually, although in the end I I, did, I went to another I read another part, but I was actually trying to speak to the nomads because I was trying to look at how we could create uh, technologies for them, um, so that yes they like moving from place to place and they are causing a lot of nuisance and destruction. So I want a situation whereby we create a technology for them, uh, a working system where they can actually. It gives them that illusion of moving from place to place, you see, but it is actually trying to conserve the environment. So their housing is sustainable. They are not felling woods here and there. All the, their settlement practices, their mobility practices, their feeding um, practices uh, for, their, for their cattle is sustainable. So, um, so that was what I was trying to speak with, uh, speak to, and uh, that I think addresses your question. So, Going forward, uh, in as much as um, I was speaking to the, white, the, the, the orthodox urban setting where, okay, we have pop-up cities. I also want for that, I, will also, I also look forward to that idea where we're able to satisfy the, the needs, the cultural needs of the Maasai, the Karamoja, uh, the people in South Sudan who are also having that same problem uh, in Mali, the Dogon and the Fulani, it's uh, around uh, West Africa too. So I was also looking at that. Um, so thank you, Mark. So, so and um, to the so one of the questions that talked about um, COVID and moving from place to place, yeah, during COVID, COVID brought about um, we said a new normal. So um, why for a lot of people, um, means of livelihood was totally dead. You see, it it uh, it it ignited another. It evoked another sense of uh, community again, and that's a virtual community. So. The delivery, yeah, a lot of people had to shut up, shut their physical shops and their physical commercial activities, and they were just locked up. But then you now began to have people who were transacting online. Um, the, 
I don't know what you call this Uber Eats, um, the mobile um, mobile uh, shops here and there. So that, in a sense, too, uh, brought about another sense of mobility, uh, mo uh, uh, mobility in in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a economic practices. So uh, so it, it it depends on the side you look at it. You in in these things you have a plus and you have a minus, uh, a positive and negative. Um, I don't know. I think. Um, uh, Mr. Njogu, uh, Dr. Njogu Morgan, uh, I can't remember his question. I don't know if he's, okay, okay. So, um, okay, then to wrap up, I will say thank you, everybody. And uh, I am tempted to speak to um, some of the concerns of about the uh, my co-presenter. Um, I want to speak as a, in the place of an architect and urban planner. Um, the concerns um, that was expressed by him and um, the the bulk of um, uh, fellow participants in this um, in this uh, gathering uh, are valid. So, but what I want to say is that these these things are just uh, they are multifaceted. Uh, when we talk about the flooding issue, uh, we would want to talk about um, the the uh, the dam that was built by Cameroon on um, the River Benue, and that dam. There was an agreement that Nigeria also should build a dam. So that dam was built in 1977, and Nigeria didn't build this dam. Nigeria started the dam and abandoned it. So that dam, if the river Benue was allowed to flow its natural course, probably there might be flooding, but not as extensive as this. But then on, on the river Benue in Cameroon, uh, there is a Lagdo dam or the Lake Lagdo. It's, it traps water. Then over after 10 years or five years, the, 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 it, 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 it overflows its uh, capacity and the government of Cameroon releases this. So originally Nigeria was to build a retaining dam, which is about two times or uh, multiple times the capacity of the Cameroonian dam so that it traps in water for irrigation and um, hydroelectric power. Unfortunately, um, Nigeria didn't fulfill that part of the bargain. And that is that contributed to uh, now, in a lot of parts of Nigeria, everywhere is flooded. You see. Then, um, talking about urban planning, we had we we've we've, we've had um, different experiences around Africa where we talked about the colonial planning, which was actually biased to um, the indigenous or the the indigenous peoples of Africa. I think it's the same thing with Onitsha. Of yes, so maybe. Um, technically, and again, in Nigeria, we had this problem after the civil war, during the civil war. Um, initially, um, the regional governments had a lot of say in um, urban planning policy. But then after the civil war, um, we had um, a tier of policy. So the national government takes a lot of um, powers away from the regions. So that also played a part. So policy played a part. So in, in that sense, the same problem Lagos had uh, Ibadan has it's the same problem Onitsha has, but that also does not negate the fact that okay, in as much as we want to claim that colonial planning was not okay or was by was not um, so perfect, the truth is that um, I, I speak from a point of um, I don't know if I'm speaking from a point of authority, but the truth is that as Nigerians, if we want to be true to ourselves, um, the best of planning we've had was the colonial one. That's the truth. Well, after a few years, we have not done anything. We still point to the colonial glories or the ones immediately after independence. And that's, that's the unfortunate truth. So I think it's a multifaceted one. The government, the national government, the, the state, the regional government do not have much policy power. And, um, and the national government has been failing successively um, in it. So it's a, it's a it's, and, but that does not still negate the fact that um, there have been um, some kind of punitive policies towards um, that part of the country. And that also accounts for the seats at home, uh, the secession um, agitation. So, um, so thank you very much. Uh, that's my contribution. Uh, great. And uh, Matthias, I, I think they have about 10 minutes left before okay. they have to leave for lunch. So just to keep that in mind. Okay, thank you. My co-presenter has um, already um, done some justice to what I want to point out on um, colonial map. Um, um, just as uh, I also thank the third, third speaker, I noted your suggestions and I will work on it. It's a, it's a paper in progress, I work on it. Thank, but just as my co-presenter said, 
the colonial map. If, if we are discussing the colonial map as it was truncated and all those things, and people that witnessed the war in an oral interview and focus group discussion are arguing and saying that there was this mobility was not as stiff as it is today in our nature. That before that before the civil war, look at where road where, look at how the mobility was, look at how it is. So it gives us a, a sense of, uh, of, of humanity that the civil war, aftermath of the civil war, look at what it did to this particular region of Igbo land. So I even at National Archives at Enugu, the, the, you see that places that was erected and constructed houses today is really a road in our nature. So there, there, is, there, 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 is, um, there is a sort of vendetta melted on the Igbo group after the war. And the mobility and the of these of these people is part of it. So my 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 research is the remapping of this on nature city. Yes, colonial might be biased and all that, but what did aftermath of the civil war do? My co-presenter just said, just mentioned what I wanted to discuss about the successive uh, after the war that the state government has no power uh, about about urban planning, whatever. Currently, as second speaker said, second speaker asked me on um, successive governments and all that, and resistance. The topic you mentioned about resistance. Yes, the incumbent governor of Anambra State is trying to work on the colonial map, and we all, if you have heard about the news, people are resisting. And also lots of fighting, even disrupting the government workers that, that even comes to uh, uh, demolish buildings in our nature, trying to say that this is a colonial road and we need to decongest the city. And we were working with colonial map to get the city how it is. So some of these things are, 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 are being worked upon that if we don't go back to at least the colonial a map of our nature. The city is, uh, is affected. And talking about flood, yes, my, my, my co-presentation about uh, Cameroonian Dam and all that. Some of these things can also, you know, when we check some of the uh, constructions in Nigeria today, illegal construction and all that, some of this can be, can, can be navigated in, in, so, in some areas. There are some areas that are not supposed to witness this flood, but because of illegal structures, some of this can, cannot even pass, pass through. The first speaker also asked about the debates of my work. Firstly, I'm, I'm trying to explore the experiences of the defeated after the war in terms of communication and mobility networks, lines, you know, using it as a point of reference. And also, what is the future of mobility in our nature as regards to the current issue facing urban cities in Nigeria. That's the, the trust of the, of, the, of the war. And I must appreciate the third speaker, and I'm working on what, um, what you mentioned about uh, residents and the people, uh, people's reaction to the government. Thank you so much. Great, thank you all uh, for your great questions. Um, I, uh, I just want to uh, encourage us all to, um, in the midst of thinking about all of this, um, to also question some of the assumptions of urban planning itself and architecture itself. Um, and I, I get a little worried when we want to, uh, um, when when the when the colonial urban plan is the solution, right? Or going back to the colonial plan is the solution. And there's there's all kinds of reasons why that in and of itself was a problematic um, model. Right, so if that's not working, then or if if current things are not working, then maybe we need to um, ask some more fundamental questions about about the nature of planning and whether planning is um, as a practice is is adequately suited or whether it's carrying some assumptions with it um, that uh, that are um, not working in in various African cities. Right, so um, 
the uh, that's one of the benefits of history and, and one of the important elements of history, very careful history, thinking thinking carefully about about the dynamics of these things, not just in terms of of kind of the unfolding of spatial dynamics, but also um, the 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 development of concepts and and practices and how they're applied in context. And so, um, you know, I, I think this is uh, the beginning of a great and interesting conversation, and we greatly appreciate your time and attention and uh, appreciate the conference organizers for welcoming us in the space as as part of this uh, this conversation. And thank you to our two presenters, uh, two young scholars uh, who are um, who are kind of at the beginning of projects, and I look forward to seeing uh, what happens going forward. Um, so I'll I'll hand it over to Njogu or whoever else um, uh, wants to continue. I know you have you have dinner plans and other things um, going forward. Yeah, thanks very much, Jennifer. Thanks to Matthias, to Samson, uh, to all of the comments from the floor. Um, I think uh, the last panel was a really nice way to end the day in a kind of imaginative, speculative, um, creative way. Um, so after, yeah, so uh, perhaps that could invite some inter interesting dreams uh, tonight uh, along the lines of creation uh, and so on. Yeah, so. I hope you've so far, I think it's been a very interesting day and you found it stimulating and exciting and we're just starting the day and there's so much more to come uh, for the next two days. Uh, just quickly, logistics after this. Um, the ones who are online, we wish you'd be with us for this. Um, but anyway, uh, there will be a shuttle at half, two, half past five, five thirty. Yeah, at 5.30, taking us back to, to the hotel, to the Bactonian Hotel, um, where you're staying. And then that gives you, then after that, it will be dinner, um, which is the evening dinner, which has been arranged for 7 o'clock. Do you want to come and talk about it, Antoinette? Wow. Uh, is that my Is that my Thank you.